our second presentation is going to be from Ultimaker, which is really one of the new kids on the block uh, for 3D printing. Uh, but they've already got a reputation for making the fastest and most accurate desktop printers. They've got an open source collaborative approach, and that's, and that's really taking 3D printing out of the tech labs, democratizing it, I suppose, and making it more accessible for the general public. So to tell us more about Ultimaker and what their machines are capable of producing, let's give a very warm welcome to Paul Croft, who's the director of Ultimaker GB. Paul. I'd like to start by uh, saying good morning to everybody. <clears throat> Clearing my throat as well tends to be a good place to start. Uh, thank you to Rakesh and Taylor Wessing for hosting this event. It's already been very inspiring for me and I've uh, learned quite a lot. I'm going to start by asking a question. Should we believe the hype? Paul's just done a great job of outlining, you know, the potential applications of 3D printing and obviously for the people in the industry or for the people already reaping the benefits, then, you know, the industrial revolution is coming. We're not quite there yet. It's going to take us a little bit of time to ascertain whether it becomes a full-scale industrial revolution, but unquestionably the potential is there. What is happening right now is a design revolution. It doesn't matter what industry you're in, the design cycle, which has always been a minimum of a month by the time you've designed, sent out for prototyping, gone through the iteration process has now been shortened to a day, just one day. So we're able to manufacture things that were never previously, previously manufacturable. Paul's just done a great job of outlining that. I'm not going to go over that. What I am going to talk to you guys about is how do we capitalize on that opportunity? And we believe on some of the things that have been discussed already this morning in openness, in sharing, and in seeding innovation. Yeah? The next generation aren't formed by linear thinking in the same way as we have been over the last however many years in society. They see the classic blue sky thinking, that's the way their world is. What 3D printing allows you to do is rather than creating a workaround from existing options that are available to us, it allows you to create or fabricate, whatever word you choose to use, a unique solution. So instead of going round to get to the problem, we can go straight at it. Most of us talk about innovative organisations. We talk about the value of creativity. We talk about the ability to get a workforce that is dynamic and problem solving. Okay, but let's start with the kids. Let me tell you a little bit about Ultimaker. Rakesh has done a good job of outlining it. I promise you this isn't a sales pitch for you to buy a printer. If you want one, by all means, come see me later on. But what I want to talk to you about is our core philosophy. Okay, Ultimaker was started in a fab lab. Anybody know what a fab lab is? Yeah, of course, down here at the front. Uh, recent one just opened in London, backed by RSA. It's just off Drury Lane. When you get five minutes, go down there. It's a really inspiring uh, maker space, basically. It comes from MIT. Uh, a, gentle, a gentleman called Mr. Gershenfeld basically had this premise that everybody should have access to the ability to manufacture. Okay, couple that with open source thinking and this desire to share. And fast forward several years, and there are now numerous fab labs dotted around the world. Being honest, as great as we are as a nation and how innovative we are, the UK is a little bit behind in terms of the Fab Lab movement. Holland and Germany and many areas of Europe and of course America is very, very prevalent. But Ultimaker was actually started in a Fab Lab. The gentleman called Dr. Adrian Bowyer, who, um, who was, what's it called, who was an English chap, he started the RepRap movement, which is where the 3D printing 3D printers came from. Our founders were sat in a Fab Lab in Utrecht and they became very frustrated, to say the least, that the printer wasn't reliable, that it was very slow, and that it was very difficult to get the high quality prints that you needed in order to realise the values of 3D printing. So what did they do? They collaborated, they communicated, and together they came up with the design for the Ultimaker original. Initially just sold as a laser cut kit that was just not, not even an established company. Consumer demand then pulled that forward to the establishing of Ultimaking Limited. Yeah. From there, what then happened next was that they then started assembling the printers because, much like my good self, not everybody has the time or the wherewithal or the technical capabilities to assemble a 3D printer. Fast forward to this year and the Ultimaker 2, which you see in front of you, which we've got outside, please come and have a look, has just been voted the best consumer product at the 3D print show in London. Why? There's one very important thing. Yes, the speed of the printer. Yes, the reliability of the printer is great. But more importantly, it's because of our open source thinking. What do I mean by open source thinking? Well, we believe in sharing. 
Open source originally was associated with, um, with code. You know, it comes from your source code. Do you share your source code with other people? Well, we don't, we don't stop at the code. This is our software Cura, which slices your 3D model, as Paul was describing, takes a 3D scan, a CAD profile, or something you've downloaded from a file repository, slices it basically into what's called a G-code, otherwise just a vector diagram, and then basically hot plastic, or now copper, and some even nanomaterials we're now experimenting with, are then squirted from the printer head into very, very fine definition, which allows you to do things. But back to this open source side of things, why is it important to us? Well, everything we do is open source, from the software, which the most recent developments had three community members contribute to the pause button now being added to the printer capability. Imagine that kudos. Rather than just having the 70 people that now work out in Holland in the, in the manufacturing side, we have 10,000 collaborators worldwide who aren't doing this because somebody's paying to do it. They're not doing this because somebody's telling them to do it. They're doing it because they're passionate about it and they want to share. And it's that belief to share that seeds innovation. Okay, I keep jumping. I apologise with my hands. We started the Create Education Project, okay, in the UK. This is a UK initiative because we wanted to share 3D printing. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Yes, that is me. Feel free to call me Shrek. I often get shouted down. I prefer the Incredible Hulk, but that's actually a, a 3D scan of my face that's been printed. The reason I put it on there is partly to give you a giggle halfway through the day looking at my uh, Shrek-like face, but it's more to say a little bit about me. Why did I want to pursue this through the education? Well, my mum, my dad, my stepmom and my stepdad are all teachers. Okay, So the moment I saw 3D printing, I had the inevitable drooling, which most people and hopefully some of you will encounter today looking at the printers. And I was like, this is absolutely amazing. So I rushed around, was telling the family, walking out of my day job you know, with a big corporate American company to go and start Ultimaker GB. And instantaneously, what I realised was that we can't just drop some of this new tech stuff in. Yes, you've got your early adopters who will get it, but if we want to make this sticky, and we really want to seed innovation, not just in the more forward-thinking businesses or the law practices like Taylor Wessing, who pride themselves on being innovative, but get right down to the base level so that not just individuals or, uh, individuals or schools or even universities or businesses can become innovative, but let's make a society innovative. Let's address this youth unemployment gap by going and inspiring them in a way that they want to be inspired, by giving them the opportunity to make their dreams come true. Our Create Strategy comprises six of our core values. Given the time frames that we're operating under, I'm not going to go through that now, but please come and have a chat about it later on. This is what it's really all about. Okay, I'm going to tell you, if time permits, three quick stories. Look at the guy's face here when he sees that 3D printing. Who can remember that magic? Now, if we can somehow harness that magic and that inspiration to learn and to assimilate new information and make a pathway from education through into industry, we're all going to reap the benefits. Okay, if you're not a father or an uncle or a mother or, a, uh, or an auntie, then you might say, well, what's relevant to me? But every single person in this room is crying out for innovative employees. If you don't care about your business on a day-to-day -day basis and you think, oh, I'll find innovation and creativity another way, then I'm prepared to back the next generation for my pension pot. And I feel it's my job to facilitate this generation to embrace that spirit. We all talk about STEM or STEAM if you want to add the A in for the art. But how good a job do we do of actually switching kids on to make it relevant and make it exciting? I'm going to tell you a little story. We call it the Connor case. This is a school local to uh, where uh, Alex and I based the business up in the north of England in Chorley. We went in and um, to say that the first demonstration was a nightmare, you would have laughed. We were on a wonky table. Alex sliced his finger open when we were opening the box. We had the head teacher there, the deputy head teacher there. And it was literally one of those moments where you were going, wah, 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 you know, total embarrassment. Anyway, thankfully, my stepdad was uh, one of the senior teachers at the school. And he said, right, OK, it didn't go down fantastically well. But they are, they can see the potential of 3D printing. Come back in. But let's do something with the kids. So we thought, brilliant. As you can see, the kids were quite impressed. But there was one lad who wasn't. Now, if I can ask you to cast your minds back to school, there was always a one kid there who was too cool for school. Let me paint you a picture. Blonde hair down to his backside, slightly bigger than his peers. Alex and I walked in with an Ultimaker original. All his friends, woof, round the printer. Wow, this is awesome. What can I make? What can I make? What can I make? Back to what Paul referred to. Not restricted by, oh, this needs to work or that needs to work. Just literally, what can I do? How am I going to make it happen? Connor, not interested. Carried on, sitting at his desk, hacking away, wasn't interested in anything we had to say. Alex went across and said, come on, mate, come and look at this. All your friends are really interested. No, I'm not bothered. Not bothered. No, far too cool for school. Not interested in the slightest. 
So I thought, oh, well, Alex wasn't very persuasive. I'll go and have a word with him. Come on, mate. Similar sort of rhetoric. Come and have a look at this. No, no, still not interested. Who's this strange bloke in, on my turf, my territory in school, trying to tell me what to do? Anyway, the one thing that motivates even the most cynical person, in my experience, is peers. And after 15, 20 minutes of us being stood there and a cup appearing on a blank, on a blank bill platform, and a cup was suddenly appeared, and his friends were getting more and more increasingly excited. Eventually, Connor became interested, and he, he started moving his mates out, laying into the front. Oh, let's have a look at this, let's have a look. And as he got to the front, you could see his face start to change. Now, for me, that's one inspiring lesson about 3D printing. If you can take somebody like that and just reintegrate them into a classroom so that he's enthusiastic like the rest of his peers are, there's a little bit of magic. The magic doesn't stop there. What happened next was Connor then went home that evening. And um, it used to be called Google SketchUp, but it's a, a free open design software called SketchUp. And that was what the school used to do their 3D modelling. Coupled with Cura, our free open source software, which I mentioned before, Connor all of a sudden, without even having access to a 3D printer, had the ability to go home and design and create <laughs> something. Now, little did we know, how could we, that he had a broken door handle. So using SketchUp, he modelled a door handle for himself. Using Cura, he sliced it into a 3D file, 3D file format. He came back into school the following day with a little SD card going, Miss, 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 please can I print this off? Now, instantaneously, he'd gone from literally the school bad lad, you know, the northern expression for it, it's cock of the school, yeah, to now all of a sudden being top, top of the class, shining beyond his peers because he'd taken control of his own learning and development outside of core hours with nobody telling him what to do and had gone and made and fabricated a solution that made his life better. Now, that's pretty magical for me, and if we could get every single person in this room and beyond, and there's def definitely the next generation, to think that way and to take ownership of improving their own life, using 3D printing as a catalyst, the world's going to be a better place. There's one more bit of magic about this story that's really, really inspiring to me. It's not just the fact that he went home and took on his own learning and development in terms of something he was excited about, but all of a sudden it switched him back on to maths and science and English. His grades in other subject areas started to improve because all of a sudden he could see that maybe school did offer him something that was exciting to him. And that if he could tap into that same enthusiasm that he had for 3D printing and getting a new door handle and apply that to maths or science or English, then his quality of his life moving forward is going to be a lot better. That's just one example of a school side of things. We talked already about um, um, the... Um, how do I put this? The automotive sector. This isn't strictly automotive. This is actually uh, an aerofoil from a Formula student race car. Most of the universities around the world, and the more prestigious ones under their engineering departments, make basically Formula One racing cars or Formula student racing cars. Now, we gave, um, as a sponsorship, uh, one of our uh, Ultimaker Originals to Cardiff University. Okay. 2013, they did all right. They were placed, I believe, 82nd or something like that overall. Don't quote me on that bit, I'm not sure. But 2014, there was one difference. Obviously, a year's more experience, and then an Ultimaker original put into there. Okay? For the naysayers, and I asked at the start about, do you, should you believe the hype? You know, do we care about creativity and innovation? Of course we do. But even the most cynical person cares about the bottom line. Would anybody here, other than Alex, who's heard this story on a million occasions, like to guess how much they saved from 2013 to 2014, oops, 2014's car? Not by printing final parts for the car, only the nose cone was finally printed on our Ultimaker, but by going through a design process, which incorporated, yes, a slightly elongated design process, which was shortened by 3D printing, how much money did they save as a percentage year on year? Somebody give me a number. 50. You'd be pretty impressed, wouldn't you, if they would save 50%. Okay, would, is there anybody in here who wouldn't like a 50% cost saving year on year for their business? It was 70. 70%. I was speaking to a gentleman from Barclays Capital the other day, and his attitude towards 3D printing, having seen some of the plastic models that we had, and you know, I'd started talking to him about the healthcare benefits that Paul's just alluded to. When I told him that he could save 70% by changing his internal design process, is a, is, is fundamental view on 3D printing changed. So let me give you one more example. I'll come back to that in a second. Imperial College. There's people in here, I believe, from Imperial College. We're very proud to announce as part of our create education strategy and to seed this innovation and to give people access so that they can share. We're looking to appoint 50 hubs around the country. We've already had lots of interest. We've already appointed a few of them. And this is one of them. Imperial College ran an event in their advanced hack space called Additive Sounds. 
Now, for me, the, the sustainability of 3D printing and like where the future is is going to be pulling on people's passions. So to combine the passion of people's um, love for music with the new tech that was 3D printing offers and then couple it with the bright minds of Imperial College, you should have seen what they came up with in 48 hours. Within 48 hours, we had um, motion sensors that could give a, a fully, fully immersive experience, you know, that were, were made. You know, we had new instruments, we had new tunes. Absolutely everything was uh, really inspiring. And that was in 48 hours. So if we can incorporate this sort of thinking and facilitate the opportunity for the younger generation and, our, and ourselves to incorporate 3D printing with traditional manufacturing methods like the haberdashery that you can see across the top there in schools, then we're going to be in a really inspiring space. We've already talked about some of the medical applications and improving people's lives. And you know what's great is this is really affordable. You now our printers cost between you know a thousand pounds and two thousand pounds. That's not a lot of money for a school, a college, a university, or a business to go and seed innovation. How do we realise this? I mentioned at the start about open source. Yeah, open source for us is not just about the code. It's about the philosophy. You can go and download the source files for the Ultimaker Original and the Ultimaker Two on our website. If you want to build an exact clone of our printer, you are welcome to. But what we actually find is that by making ourselves open, by sharing and giving other people the opportunity to collaborate, then our rate of innovation is considerably higher. I will back a global sharing community who want to contribute because they're passionate about something, rather than 10 guys in a dark room trying to be innovative. That is the future. That is where, the, that is where real innovation is going to come from. And if we do that and set people up so that they can imagine it, make it, the world's going to be a good place. Thank you very much. Thank you.